the um, private message um, asking if we were going to be recording this, which we are. I just just hit record, so the recording just won't won't include our introductions. Um, but we will just as one point. Um, I will be sending out the recording and the slides um, afterwards, um, probably tomorrow. And we'll also include a short um, survey that'll that'll only take um, a couple minutes. So if if you wouldn't mind just filling that out afterwards, so we can get that feedback and utilize that feedback to um, improve for for future presentations. Um, so the structure today um, will have three parts, um, and each of those three parts, um, the three of us will each will each complete one. We'll be starting with the current times that we're living in and discussing psychology of prejudice, both a little bit about the history and our evolutionary past as it relates to prejudice and uh, in groups and group bias, um, as well as discussing uh, habits, habit formation, how to break a bad habit, and the differences between um, good and bad habits and the challenges associated with building good habits. And then we will discuss digital wellness and how to utilize um, the technology around us as a positive force rather than something that um, is a negative force for us and for our mental health. Now, this is a video that perhaps some of you have seen before, or perhaps you haven't. It's about a minute long. Um, and as we watch this, I really want us all to think about the point of privilege. What are things that we are able to do that others aren't? What are things in life that we don't have to worry about that others fear and maybe fear for their lives about. So as we think about those issues, let's, let's watch the video. The sound, the sound. One sec, sound is off. Sound is off, just a second. If that's not working, we could show it from YouTube. Uh, no, no worries. Uh, can uh, can you can I stop sharing? Yeah. How do I stop share? Okay. So. It should work now. Check your privilege edition. Put a finger down if you have been called a racial slur. Put a finger down if you've been followed in a store unnecessarily. Put a finger down if someone has crossed the street to avoid passing you. Put a finger down if you've had someone clinch their purse in an elevator with you. Put a finger down if you've had someone step off of an elevator to keep from riding with you. Put a finger down if you've been accused of not being able to afford something expensive. Put a finger down if you have had fear in your heart when being stopped by the police. Put a finger down if you have never been given a pass on a citation that you deserved. Put a finger down if you have been stopped or detained by police for no valid reason. Put a finger down if you have been bullied solely because of your race. Put a finger down if you have been denied service solely because of the color of your skin. Put a finger down if you've ever had to teach your child how not to get killed by the police. Any fingers left? That's privilege. All right, well, that's a uh, certainly a powerful video. Um, now, I'd like people to write in the chat box and um, mention one thing that pops into your mind, really the first thing that you think of when seeing this video. Um, Check your... So, yep, if you could just put one thing there. As, as we await a couple responses, um, the, the thing that really stood out to me was that... Um, thinking about the next generation. And you saw the husband and wife had their child in the video, um, who seems to be biracial. And the one instance where um, the mother put, the, put her finger down was as it relates to the next generation and having to teach your kids how to protect themselves. Um, so I see a couple responses coming in. Inequality, yep, so that the differences um, and, and what different people have to deal with and worry about on a daily basis. Black Lives Matter, absolutely. And we're gonna talk a bit about more about that, about um, why that's even something that needs to be said in the first place, right? Um, awareness, yep, yep, some, some great responses coming in. Um, so, um, what's it, what, go back, go back. So what's important to think about is that 
the reason why there's so much discussion about um, inequality and injustice going on right now has been sparked by the recent murder of George Floyd. Um, and we have a, a beautiful portrait of him right here. Um, and what's important to think about is that, yes, that the one instance of that has been shown on TV that we've seen pictures of over and over again is horrible, clearly. However, it is truly a sign of systems that are broken, systems that allow for a lack of accountability as it comes to policing, systems that perpetually um, oppress and hold down my, uh, black people and people of color. So as we go through the rest of this presentation, particularly the first section on psychology of prejudice, I want us all to think about the various systems that are in place and how um, we can work to dismantle those systems so that we can live in a more just society. Um, and also, as we, as we um, look at this presentation, I want us all to recognize the history of nativism. And uh, I'll discuss nativism in the US, and we'll also discuss later um, nativism in other places in the world. But um, in the US, there's a history of um, so the systemic, the, the systemic not allowing of certain groups of people, whether they be black people, whether they be Jews, whether they be Mexicans, whether they be immigrants in general. We like to think of the country as a melting pot and uh, the, the United States certainly aims to be um, a melting pot for people of all races, religions, genders, etc. cetera. Um, however, there is a dark history of um, discrimination and uh, certainly an ugly side of um, of nativism of not letting people and not encouraging people from outside the U.S. to to immigrate and to to feel welcome. And one one recent um, as you see two um, signs on the on the left and on the bottom right, um, sort of a little bit older from past decades. But even Barack Obama, the first black president, had to deal with a um, number of racist attacks on whether or not he was even people, you know, claiming that he wasn't born in this country. And as you can see, um, the vicious history of lynching um, brought up by, by people viciously attacking um, him for, for being black. So um, as we, you know, thinking about these issues and recognizing um, the, the issue of nativism and discrimination of, of people um, based on where they come from or based on their race or ethnicity. Um, so, welcome everyone once again. Uh, talking about psychology of prejudice and discrimination, I always used to wonder why we as humans are divided and why do we discriminate against each other. And this discrimination is not just limited to racism, but there's a common pattern of prejudice across the world, be it racist attacks, be it religious disputes, be it mistreatment of animals, sporting rivalries, or countries going to war. There's a common us versus them uh, theme that emerges. And therefore, in the wake of all this happening, uh, we wanted to share with you the psychology of prejudice. Uh, how does science explain us versus them mentality? Um, and I love this quote by Mahatma Gandhi. He says that no two leaves are alike, yet there is no hatred between them, between the branches they grow on. Um, but we as humans show discrimination on so many fronts. So before we dive into the psychology part, let's check out some other common occurrences of prejudice across the world. And we'll go through them uh, pretty quickly. So this photo uh, is of religious Hindu Muslim riots, which have become very common uh, occurrence in India during the past few months. The next is homophobia. We know that only 26 countries in the world have legalized same-sex marriages, which constitutes less than 15% of the total number of countries in the world. So it's like a universal plague that affects us. The next is sexism, especially in corporations where we see that women only make up 5% of the CEOs and 21% of the board members in top 500 companies in the US. In India, it's pretty much the same with women holding only 7% of the senior management positions in the organizations. The next is another example of sexism in sports in terms of pay gap. 
we can clearly see that women earn only a small fraction of what men earn in the sports. This one is also another example of sexism uh, from the world of sports. For the same sport, men's uniforms are created to enhance performance, while women's clothes are designed to make them look more sexual and attractive. Uh, the issue of discrimination uh, on the basis of color is not just across US, it's across the world. And this slide shows a, bi a bias towards the white skin um, that is alarmingly overt, especially in India. We are one of the largest consumers of skin lightening creams in the world. And the photo on the right side, as you can see, is from a matrimonial advertisement where most families want their sons to marry a fair skinned girl. The next one uh, is uh, uh, another form of prejudice and um, it's how people view women in hijab and men in turbans. Even at the airports, uh, certain sections of the people are frisked more than others. And this, this kind of prejudice is very, very overt. The next one is called nativism where people from one state discriminate against people from another state. Uh, this has become rampant recently. Uh, recently, the Delhi government in India tried to pass a law whereby only people from Delhi, the state of Delhi, could be admitted to hospitals for coronavirus pandemic. Uh, fortunately, that bill was not allowed to pass. And uh, the next slide really disappoints me. It disappoints me because the prejudice is not just limited to humans, but it affects animals also. During the past few months, we realized how challenging it could be for us to not go out of our houses and stay caged, caged in our homes, literally. But we ourselves, we keep animals in zoos and circuses and poultry farms and aquariums. And rabbits are used in experiments for testing cosmetic products because they don't have tear ducts, so they can't cry and the, and the cream won't get washed away, even if they were in extreme pain. We also discriminate between the animals and there's a stark difference in how we treat and love our cats and dogs and we create millions of YouTube videos on them while we mercilessly eat other animals like cows and goats. So why do some animals get more affection than others? And why does our planet have so much prejudice and discrimination? And where does this prejudice come from? So that's what we'll be talking about uh, in this section. And um, uh, what I wanted to talk about was uh, prejudice from an evolutionary point of view. What does uh, evolutionary psychology have to say? Um, because what we are today is often because of millions of years of evolution and our bodies influence the way we act, the way we, the way we think and the way we behave. So what does, uh, how does evolutionary psychology explain this? Well. Humans are biologically herd animals, which means when we were cavemen, for survival, we relied more on cooperation rather than strength. And we were dependent on other members of the herd for resources. And in such a scenario where we were dependent on others for food and security, trust becomes of utmost importance. So by limiting the number of members in a herd, uh, trust could be maintained and resources could be shared. So here comes the interesting part. Um, sorry, um, here comes the interesting part. If I were a caveman, how do I know if a person is from my herd or not? I couldn't just blindly trust anyone I met in the jungle. So there arose a need for differentiation. Each herd needed to look and behave differently compared to others. And this differentiation could come in the form of skin color, in the form of territory, spiritual practices, et cetera, et cetera. Anyone from my herd would then constitute us and anybody from outside would constitute them. But then how, how do biases form? Well, as the members of my herd are associated with safety, security, sharing of food, resources and information, there's, there used to be a very strong bond between the herd members, which often led to favoritism. And in order to maintain these strong bonds, psychological mechanisms like loyalty and patriotism came into picture. 
uh, loyalty towards my family, towards my tribe, towards my territory, towards our species. And that's why it's socially acceptable for us to mistreat animals, uh, but it's not socially acceptable for us to mistreat other human beings. Also, as the loyalties, uh, as the systems become more and more complex, loyalties also become more and more complex. Uh, so should I be loyal to the person of the same sex or should I be uh, loyal to the person of the same territory? This gave rise to a concept called concentric loyalties. At the center is the loyalty to myself, then the loyalty to my family, then the herd, then the territory, and then the species. In modern times, this division could come on the basis of religion, race, profession, countries, etc. So uh, this, uh, this slide is a very interesting example from my personal life. Uh, it talks about in-group loyalties. Um, and I was traveling in, uh, in a bus one day and uh, I had accidentally lost my wallet and I didn't realize it. So uh, I boarded the bus and when the conductor came to me, uh, and asked me for money, I didn't have my wallet. So the conductor started harassing me and he stopped the bus. And you know he made me step out of the bus uh, and he was continuously arguing with me. And then a fellow Sikh uh, guy was traveling by, uh, passing by, and he stopped and he saw what was happening and he uh, confronted the bus conductor and asked him to stop harassing me. And he even paid for my ticket. The reason he stopped me was because I was wearing a turban myself and he himself was wearing one. So he felt like a moral obligation uh, to help me, uh, to come forward and help me. And it was a beautiful gesture, uh, but also at the same time, it was a great example of in-group loyalty. So uh, till now, we talked about uh, how the goodness towards our group works. How do we show favoritism? But how does this translate to hatred and oppression towards others? Um, well, as the groups become larger and larger, the, uh, to sustain the differentiation and loyalty, there arises uh, a need for certain rules and protocols. Uh, these rules and protocols cannot be compromised on. And uh, therefore, they are projected as morally correct behavior. So um, because these rules could be different for different groups, um, something which is moral, morally right for me could be absolutely immoral for another group. Um, as an example, people in coastal areas uh, rely on fish as a food because that's, that makes sense. That's all that's available. While people in other areas may rely on fruits and vegetables uh, and their spiritual practices could, uh, could prohibit them from eating a live animal like a fish. So when these groups come together and they, the contact increases and they start mingling with each other, these moral differences uh, could, could lead to intolerance, especially in today's time of uh, globalization. Uh, also, as the biggest groups have the biggest number of people and they have, they have the most amount of resources, uh, they, they have a control. Uh, because they have these resources and because of the in-group biases, they don't want to share these resources with others and they show favoritism towards their own group members. As a result, the rich keep getting richer uh, while, the, uh, while the poor keep getting poorer. And this may lead to oppression and frustration among the minorities, especially when it comes to competi competition over resources or political power. Uh, majorities have a significant control over minorities. And the sad part is that even when people do try to change and include minorities into their groups, it reduces intergroup differentiation, as we discussed before. And this can threaten the social identity of other group members. Um, I wanted to talk about this slide. This, this is a, a phrase from India. It mean, it, it's called Aham Brahmasmi. Um, it means that I am the universe the creator and the creation are all one. We are all one. Uh, but we often forget this. We all forget that we all have the same basis of origin. We are all part of the same cosmic entity, whatever it is. Uh, and not only humans, but animals, trees, mountains, rivers, and glaciers. We are all one. And we can break free of the outdated survival mechanisms uh, that were um, that were coming from our evolutionary psychology. 
and we can let go of these divisions. As a species, we have evolved to a certain level of consciousness where we can slowly let go of these biases. So the important question is, how do we do it? Um, well, uh, here are some of, the, uh, some of the ways in which we can do it. Number one is letting go of the labels, labels that only divide us. These labels could be labels like an athlete, a psychologist, a coach, father, mother, Indian or American. These labels create unnecessary divide and only depict a fragment of our whole being. Yes, I am an Indian. Yes, I am a Sikh. I am an aspiring psychologist. I am a soccer player. But as a whole, I am much more than that. The second is supporting uh, businesses that support social justice. Uh, as we discussed, a lot of this is stemming from the lack of resources and inequity of sharing of those resources. So by, uh, by, by promoting businesses which, uh, which uh, belong to minorities, we can uh, bring about some amount of social equity. Number three is acknowledging the discrimination and having honest and real conversations with minorities. We often shy away from discussing these topics. Uh, a lot of my friends recently have been saying, why do we have to say black lives matter? Uh, shouldn't all lives matter? Well, of course, yes, all lives do matter. But in the current system, uh, inequity exists and black lives aren't being valued uh, as they should. And therefore, there's a need to explicitly call it out and point out that black lives matter just like other lives do. The next uh, way is by interacting uh, with people who have different backgrounds compared to ours, talking to social justice educators about their stories and the work they do and what motivated them to take up this cause. Uh, we often get stuck in our daily routines and the same circle of friends. But by meeting new people, we can learn so much more about, uh, about the things that are beyond our tiny universes. Uh, so, uh, and we can even develop empathy towards others by doing so. The next is uh, introducing the idea of social justice to someone who's never heard of the term, someone who's never studied sociology, someone who doesn't know about the concept. And uh, one of my professors calls this a grandma test, which means explaining a new concept to somebody who's uh, to, to your grandma uh, by breaking it down into a very simple structure with very simple language uh, and then explaining it to them. And by doing this, not only their understanding increases, uh, our, own, our own concepts, they become crystal clear. Um, the next one is attending uh, social justice seminars and conferences in, in your area, something like this. Uh, these conferences not only help us understand the stories of people who are oppressed, but also provides us with the tools necessary to develop ourselves and help others. Uh, plus, it's a great way to network. I met Josh at the ASP National Conference last year, and that's how I got this job. So it's always a win-win. Uh, the last, and I think probably the most important one, is being mindful of our knowledge and making uh, our language and making sure that it's inclusive. Uh, and confronting a family member or a friend when they discriminate or use non-inclusive no, uh, language. This is important because oftentimes our silence could be misconstrued as acceptance. But uh, my personal philosophy is that whenever somebody uses that language, I respectfully yet assertively point it out. And that's my philosophy and it works pretty well. So um, we talked about the basic psychology of discrimination, why it exists, where it comes from, and what are some of the tools that we may use to address this. We also know that this change is not going to happen overnight. It's a lifelong process of learning and changing our old habits. And in the last few months, uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic, we, our lifestyles have anyway dramatically changed. So once we get back to our new normal, uh, we need to re-examine our habits and establish new ones. So Josh will now take us through how we can develop these habits and not just for returning to our old lives, but also for bringing about social justice uh, and becoming better human beings. Over to you, Josh, now. All right, thank you, Gagandeep, that was, that was great. Um, one sec, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, should be able to 
Oh, can you see my presentation? Am I doing this right? Yes. Right, it's loading up. Um, cool. You can everyone can see it. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you, Gagandeep. That was uh, certainly a very important topic um, for these times. Um, Black Lives Matter and the whole movement that's going on right now is really not um, not just a trend, but really a um, hopefully an awakening for society of of many of these issues that um, we discussed. So thank you for addressing that. Um, as we um, as we reemerge to back to society, back to the new normal, as it's being called, um, there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, number one, being comfortable with uncomfortability, because there will be situations that will make you uncomfortable, uh, particularly if you've been at home most of the time over the last three months or so. Um, there, you, you will inevitably run into situations that will make you uncomfortable. So to be, uncom to be comfortable with those feelings of uncertainty and uncomfortability and to pre actually prepare for them ahead of time is, is extremely important. Number two, the concept of controlling the controllables, which is an important concept within sports psychology, but also within this side, within this time when so much is out of our control. So much about society is different from how it's been in the past and, and we may have restrictions about how we can behave and things will be, um, and how things are. So controlling what can be controlled, but we're, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, also easing back into normal life. Now this um, particularly, we'll, we'll talk about this for society as a whole, but we'll also talk about this for athletes. And the idea is that if you try to do everything that you were doing before without any sort of transition period, you run the risk of injuring yourself. You run the risk of serious frustration as well. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about goals, um, different types of goals, and then also habits and habit development um, during this time. So you want to be uncomfortable. We want to be comfortable with uncomfortability. Um, by expecting the uncomfortability ahead of time, you can respond to the situation at hand rather than simply reacting. So what does that mean exactly? Um, now you want to talk to yourself beforehand. You want to actually rehearse the situation, maybe through visualization, um, maybe through uh, utilizing other mental skills, such as mindfulness, and really trying to um, actually be aware of the situation as it's taking place. You can also utilize self-talk and affirmations as the situation is taking place. And really be clear with yourself, have a clear intention on how you want to respond to the situation. If you're clear about how you intend to respond, then you won't find yourself simply reacting and lashing out if you're in an uncomfortable situation. A few um, possible uncomfortable situations that could happen in the coming weeks or the coming months. Um, you could be outside and somebody could walk up right next to you without any thoughts of social distancing. You could see somebody nearby without a mask on, coughing or sneezing, and wondering, hey, do they, do they have COVID-19? Are they potentially infecting me or other people around? Um, or you could be invited to a gathering or a social event and feel uncomfortable not knowing whether or not you want to attend. Um, so uh, you want to, number one, mentally prepare for these types of situations. Tell yourself how you actually want to respond. And then also the last point is awareness. Awareness is key. We talk about awareness a lot in terms of mindfulness, um, in terms of practicing meditation and practicing um, the awareness of the breath, the awareness of physical sensations, the awareness of sounds around us. But this is important, number one, for, um, for us to be awareness of ourselves and us to be aware of any physical sensations that are arising um, un of uncomfortability, of anger, of fear, so if you can be aware of that as it's happening, then you can respond in a way that you choose, in a way that you intend to, rather than simply lashing out. And then also being aware of our environment, being aware of our surroundings, so that we can um, actually protect ourselves and uh, move out of the way if, you know, if people are nearby, too, standing too close. And by being aware of the environment and everything around us, we can um, do everything that we can to keep ourselves safe. 
Next, I want to talk about controlling the controllables. Now, this is a concept within psychology and within sports psychology of focusing on those things that can be controlled rather than letting the things that are out of our control uh, take over our attention and upset us. Um, now, I like this graphic because it, it demonstrates that what you want to be focusing on are the things that matter and the things that can be controlled. So if something doesn't matter, then there's no use or it's not effective to be focusing on it. And if it can't be controlled, then no matter how much you focus on it, no matter how much you want to change it, you know, if, it, if it's a rainy day and you're focused on that, then there's, you know, it, it's not going to make any impact. So during this situation, um, particularly right now, um, as we reemerge back to society, um, use the chat box and tell me something, tell me a way where you can control the controllables right now. I'll, I'll throw out one idea just to get the, um, to get it started a little bit, um, your attitude, right? So your attitude can, you control what your attitude is like during this time. Um, your attitude certainly matters for how your experience is, and it also is something that can be controlled. But what are some other examples? Attitude, yep. What else, what else? What about um, your actions, your actions that you do every day? What is something that can be controlled? The people that you're around, yep, definitely. Um, the news sources that you expose yourself to, how you're spending your time, right? Are you doing things um, that are helping yourself and helping your mental health? Um, yep, these are all these are all excellent points. Um, so again, trying to, and again, this comes back to awareness as well, being aware of where your attention is. Are you self-talk? That's a huge piece as well. Um, but being aware of your attention, being aware of, hey, am I just really, am I in a funk today because I'm, I'm really concerned about, um, you know, how long is this situation going to last? Um, or am I, you know, is, is the thought of um, going to the grocery store and seeing so many people with masks, is that getting to me? Um, so again, remembering to focus instead on the things that can be controlled and the things that truly do matter. Just get some other responses here. Exercise, being compassionate. Awesome. Um, moving on. It's important to ease back into normal life. Now, uh, first of all, I love that picture of Usain Bolt um, looking back at his competitors a, a stride or two behind him and, and grinning. Um, but it's important um, as we come back into society to recognize that it's not going to be easy, right? And Especially, especially this is uh, specific to athletes, but when an athlete has an injury and they have to spend um, time away from the court or away from the field, oftentimes there's an urge to just come back right away and come back uh, with the same type of intensity and same type of quantity um, of training that they were doing before. However, when somebody does this, their body often isn't ready for it and they can get injured. Um, Similarly, it, it can also lead to great frustration because if somebody's been away from um, their sport, their timing might be off, their stamina, their physical fitness might not be at the same level, their quote unquote match readiness. So in sports, um, being ready to play a match, being um, sort of match tough, as it's, as it's said, um, won't, will be out of funk because they haven't been on court. They haven't been actually practicing these skills. So it's the same thing as society heads back to, um, to normal or quote unquote normal um, in that you want to take it slow and that you want to ex sort of expect that frustration ahead of time. Know that it's coming. Know that some days will be easier than others. And again, trying to respond to the situation in a way that you choose rather than simply just reacting. Um, and then lastly, we're going to dive into goals and habits. Um, so. Uh, when, when we break down goals in sports psychology, we often break it down into outcome goals, performance goals, and process goals. Outcome goal being um, the, the broader goal that you want to achieve, where performance goals are more specific metrics um, breaking down that outcome goal. Um, and then the process goals are the daily and weekly um, goals that can help get you to that point of achieving the performance goals, which, which um, help to 
um, help you achieve your overall goal, that outcome goal. Um, now, what's interesting is as it relates to sports, um, uh, oftentimes many individuals have the same outcome goal. So if we think about the NBA, for instance, essentially every single player has the same goal of winning the championship. Similarly, every player wants to be the best player in the league and win the MVP. But not everybody can do that. So despite having the same goal, what really separates people, of course, there is the, um, of course, there's the mindset. Of course, there's the physical gifts of certain individuals compared to others. But it's also the habits and the daily practices, those process goals, those performance goals that really differentiate people. It's one thing just to have the goal, but if you don't put systems in place to really achieve it, then you're not going to um, achieve what you're setting out to. Um, and then lastly, goals provide clarity and help to filter out um, certain choices that you could make. So if you have a goal to, um, to, to get a certain job, right, and you have a decision in front of you for how you want to spend your time today, and you have a job interview tomorrow morning, let's say, it makes that decision a lot easier because you have a clear goal and clear intention. Now, in terms of habits, um, and this, this is a book, much of this is based on a book from James Clear, Atomic Habits, which is highly recommended, really an excellent book. Um, but one, a few, few things um, that, are, that I found to be very interesting. Number one, he breaks down um, bad habits and good habits, why, where why does it seem that bad habits are so easy to just pick up. We don't even notice it, and all of a sudden we have this bad habit that we're trying to break. Where a good habit really takes a lot of discipline and a lot of training to develop. And the point that he makes is that a bad habit has immediate, an immediate positive effect. Where maybe you eat a donut, right? And it tastes great. You get a sugar rush, right? So the immediate impact is very positive. Or if you compare that to a good habit, like starting a workout routine, if you're not currently working out, has a much less positive immediate impact. It might be um, physically uncomfortable. It might make you sore as you start working out. Um, you might be confused. You might not see any of the physical changes in your body from starting the workout routine right away. So comparing the immediate impact of a bad habit compared to a better habit, a healthy habit, um, it's easy to see why, uh, why a bad habit is easier to pick up. He also brings this back to evolutionary terms. And um, throughout evolution, throughout most of human history, uh, humans have been in immediate impact environments. Where if you think about caveman times, um, whether or not somebody ran away from a lion, whether or not you find shelter, these are immediate impacts. Where if you based on how you make or don't make that decision, it has a very, very quick impact on your life and whether or not you can um, survive, frankly. Um, where nowadays, things like your career, where you work and maybe you get a paycheck in two weeks, or your study and that leads to a degree a few years down the road, or a relationship where you spend time and you work on that relationship and that leads to um, a greater relationship uh, down the road. These are more; these are some of the more important things in life, but they're more delayed impact environments. Um, the other, the other point that he makes is, as you try to establish new new habits, you want to make them obvious. You want to make them attractive, easy, and satisfying. Um, the more he says that the you don't necessarily need all four of these aspects, but the more of them that you can. Um, integrate into the habits um, the better. You want to make habits, um, you, as you're establishing habits, you don't want to say, I'm going to run five miles per day, right? That's going to be, you, you might be able to do that once or a few, a few times, but in order to do that consistently, in order to do that every day, it really takes a lot of discipline to get into that habit. But if you say, hey, I'm going to just walk outside every day, right? And then you start to do that every single day, and um, you build that consistency. Um, also, what's, what's interesting to think is, or also what he suggests, is linking a habit to a new environment. If you're trying to build a new habit, let's say meditation, um, 
not trying to do it in a place where you have other existing habits. So not staying, let's say, in your bed where you sleep, where you relax, but having maybe a certain room or a certain chair that becomes your meditation chair or your meditation room. And also linking that habit to a specific time. Um, also what can be used are habit trackers. Now this is um, a habit tracker that you could buy, but you could also you know, very easily make them and very clearly um, lay out the habits that you, that you um, hope to do over the course of a week, over the course of a month, and um, you know, keep track of them. And what I find helpful about this is you can look back at it week after week, month after month, and see how you're progressing, and also see if you wanna make changes. Do you wanna change any of these habits or any of these goals that you're setting for yourself? Um, last point I wanna make is, as it comes to making a change, whether that be establishing a new habit, whether that be a new way of life, or simply a new way of looking at things, as we talked about prejudice, discrimination, um, many people think of, of it as a simple path, right? So I'm going to try for something. I'm going to try to make this change and either, you know, either it's going to work or it's not going to work. Um, and that's the model that you see on the left. Either you succeed or you fail. But what generally happens, what's a, a better model to, to really think about is, um, you're going to the road to success, the road to, to winning or the road to anything really worth pursuing is challenging. And as you make an attempt, you're going to learn. As you make an attempt that fails, um, you're going to learn from that experience. It's going to give you all that information about why that was as unsuccessful. Um, so rather than just that being the end of it, as you see on the left side, um, you want to learn from it and then you want to keep going based on that information, based on learning. And then as you try again, maybe you'll fail again, right? Again, if it's challenging, that's, that, that uh, may happen. Um, but as you continue going along the path, as you keep going, you get a little bit closer every time to succeeding to, and you, you learn along the way and you ultimately improve time by time by time. This is, I know we have some uh, tennis coaches, tennis um, professionals, sports psychology professionals that work with tennis players in the audience. And uh, this, this quote, or this tattoo really, is on Stan Wawrinka's arm. He's a, a tennis champion from Switzerland, and it's a Samuel Beckett quote. Maybe you can't read it, I'll, I'll read it. Really try to take these words in. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. The point here being that as you do pursue these goals, you will fail. That is, that is certainly a part of the process of reaching new heights, of doing new things, of doing challenging things. But failing a little bit better each time, learning from those experiences, keeping going rather than just stopping at that point of failure. And lastly, a quote. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Second best time is now. As you look back at the changes that you've made in your life, perhaps you'll wish you would have made them sooner. And perhaps there are other things that you want to change and you say, oh, one day I, I really want to become a runner. One day I want to start waking up earlier. You know, I'd love to, to really start meditating once I find the time. But we know it's a long process. We know there will be ups and downs and failures along the way. So start now. That's the final message I'd like to leave you with. Now, um, I'd like to pass it over to Ankita, and she's going to talk about um, digital wellness during this time. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for the great insight. So uh, we all know that we are, as a world, we are witnessing the most challenging crisis since the World War II. And, uh, you know, the nations are fighting to, uh, and they're making efforts to emerge out of the situation, the COVID situation. And there's been a lot of unrest amongst the individuals. The emotions of fear, anxiety, and uncertainty are really ruling our lives. 
uh, also our daily work life routines have been disrupted the social norms have been redefined and uh, new laws and regulations are being enforced at different places and of course there is financial stress and distress and adding to this covid situation uh, are the other disturbing events that that are happening across the uh, world like discrimination riots in us or the indo china army standoff uh, or probably the frequent earthquakes that have been hitting the city of delhi so no doubt that uh, you know we are not in very pleasurable times and emotional states but right now i want to focus on two things that i observe are happening at the individual level they're happening with me uh, they probably happening with you and probably they're happening with all of the people around us and the first thing that i want to talk about is our over dependence on technology and the internet now of course uh, the devices the social media and the internet have been an integral part of our lives for years now but in the last couple of months we have become entirely dependent on it be it for social connections uh, be it for uh, working from home or maybe for entertainment uh, for news and and more things so uh, while i am personally grateful for internet because just imagine how difficult social distancing would have been without the internet i'm particularly concerned about the psychological and emotional impact social media creates especially during the time of crisis uh, you see the uh, use of facebook the twitter tiktok instagram whatsapp or bbc news uh they have become our past times and you know video chats zoom meetings online classes internet browsing they have found a bigger place in our daily routine now we have often heard of the phrase that we become what we consume and uh because of the covid situation uh, most of us have become worry about uh what foods we are consuming so we try to consume foods that are good for our physical body and uh, that help us build our immunity but our diets a diet for the mind has become more and more digital in nature you know our brains are constantly fed updates news and information from the news websites and the social media so now practically speaking life is very balanced in nature so for every day there is a night for sun there is a moon for darkness there is light for black there is white and for yin there is yang we all have good days and we all have bad days we all have good moments in a day and we all have bad moments in a day but what we see online is the biased version of the world uh we see extremely positive posts uh or extremely depressing news content on the internet so on social media maybe on facebook and instagram we see our friends and individuals sharing happy faces and perfectly projected lives but the news that is floated on the news app and on the social media is generally very negative terrible and depressive and that is particularly because evidence shows that people respond quicker to negative words so you are more likely to click a uh, click a like button on a headline with words like cancer bomb war death and things like that and more hits of course means more ads for the website and for the web pages and more ads simply means more business for the websites so on one hand we have we feel unfulfilled ungrateful and dissatisfied with our personal lives when we compare our uh, daily lives with those happy posts that our friends have been putting on social media and instagram and on the other end when we you know spend so much time on the news applications and the websites and on the information that we gather from the internet it just renders us with a feeling of panic stress and sometimes even helplessness so here i would want you all to take a pause and use the chat box exercise your fingers to let me know how do you feel when you check your social media wall what is the emotion that you feel do you feel happy do you feel satisfied do you feel more connected when you use social media or are there feelings of jealousy anxiety tired exhausted Kagan feels discontent, overwhelmed, connected, anxious, and at anticipation of seeing things that will worry me. Okay, satisfied. 
I personally sometimes now, especially in the COVID situation where I'm spending so much time at home, sometimes I fall into the rabbit hole of social media wherein I open my app for just checking the updates for two minutes. I end up spending 10, 15, 20 minutes up to one hour on, on these apps. And then I feel really, really irritated and, uh, you know, exhausted, uh, tired physically. Uh, sometimes you take a nap after okay great so which brings me to the next question which is essentially why is that you know a lot of you a lot of people uh, they may not experience positive emotions including me I generally do not feel positive emotions when I uh, go on the internet but still we go back and spend hours and hours on social media so why is that we are doing this but what happens in crisis situations, especially when our daily routines and lives get disrupted, many of us start to lose our purpose in our lives. You see, our days are scattered. We do not have any motive to get out of the bed and there is no daily routine to follow. We start living lives without any focus or aim in life and we indulge in activities and behaviors that basically are distracting us from our lack of purpose. So I want all of you to imagine your purpose of life, your aim in life as the root system for your tree of life. So the branches and the leaves uh, of the tree represent your daily actions. And it is the purpose in life that actually these are the roots and they fuel your daily activities. And with this, we develop a meaning in life with the feelings of achievement, fulfillment and satisfaction. Furthermore, having a purpose also uh, helps us dedicated, uh, dedicate our life resources, which is basically time, energy, and money, which are limited in nature. So purpose helps us direct all these resources in a particular direction towards particular goals. Uh, you know, especially in the modern world, we have so many options and distractions. And it is only when we have a strong purpose in life, it reduces the conflict of spreading our energies towards different things and it channelizes our efforts towards our goals. Now, if something happens in the environment, we deal with a crisis situation, our purpose uh, becomes uncertain and unstable and our roots become unstable and we tend to lean towards unconscious misaligned behaviors. And because in today's world, digital behaviors are the things that have least resistance, it is very uh, easy to reach out to your smartphone or to your laptop and just access internet because the resistance is less. We generally tend to indulge ourselves in digital behaviors that are not aligned to the purpose in life. Now, talking about the significance of purpose, this person on screen is Viktor Frankl, a guy who had gone through three concentration camps during the World War II. And he went through these concentration camps as the physician of the uh, prisoners. And he found something. He said that if you weren't murdered outright or starved by the Nazis, having a purpose was a big predictor of whether you would survive or not. So he observed that people who lost their purpose they would either start getting sick or they would just start dying. Therefore, staying connected to the purpose in life or repurposing your life in difficult situations is very, very critical to navigate uh, uh, a situation like this successfully. Furthermore, Nietzsche also stated that he who has a why can almost handle anyhow. Of course, uh, science has been adding uh, 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 you know, to the findings of Viktor Frankl, and now various researchers, uh, various studies have found that having a purpose in life can also help us improve our immunity, can make us more resilient, increase longevity, help uh, us improve sleep and diet habits, and eventually can also lead to financial gains. Uh, while these are the proven benefits of having a purpose, the side effects are, or the down effects of purpose are also not that bad. You see, having a purpose can reduce cognitive conflict and the feeling of fear and panic. It can also lead to less inflammation in the body and one has less chances of depression and job burnout. Well, I personally would like to consider having a purpose in life uh, as a magic pill for a good life. 
this brings me to the last and the most important question that if purpose is so important, how do we identify, how do we know what our purpose is and how do we align our purpose to our daily activities? And for this, I propose a 3H framework. 3H basically stands for heart, head and hands. And I, I truly, truly believe that when we integrate our heart with our brain and with our actions, great lives can be led. So let me begin with this framework with the first step, the heart. Uh, the heart is involved in knowing your purpose. So if I were to ask you, what is the theme of your life? What would you say? You see, we all have themes for our room. We have themes for our home. We also have themes for our desktops and smartphones. We have themed birthday parties and we also have themed parks. And having a theme simplifies us to decide which color we should paint our walls, what type of furniture we should have in our home, what dress should we wear for a party, and what rights can we expect in a park. Similarly, once you identify the theme of your life, it becomes the source of your purpose. For example, if you ask me, uh, my personal uh, theme of my life would be well-being. So whether it's my sleeping habits, whether it's my eating habits, it's my work schedule, or the little actions that I take on a daily basis, uh, they sort of keep well-being as a priority. Uh, in fact, my work and my programs have a similar theme. So you see, uh, the theme that you identify for your life is mostly related to your relationship with yourself. And that is why I say that we use our heart for this step. Let's keep the brain, the head and the hands aside. And I want you to use your heart when you want to identify the theme of your life, when you want to identify the purpose of your life and reflect on these questions like what matters to you most, who inspires you, what causes do you care about? What are you grateful for? What gets you out of the bed in the morning? And, and, and most importantly, how do you want to be remembered? Once you answer these questions from your heart, you will get to the why of your life, which is the source of your, pur uh, which is your, the source of your purpose. Moving to the second edge, which is the head. And this is a step wherein we identify the performers. Now to practice the central theme of your life, you will have to behave and act in a certain way on a daily basis. You need to portray certain behaviors and qualities to be true to your purpose. Uh, for example, if your theme of your life is uh, being a healer or you consider yourself as a healer, you may want to practice calmness, compassion, and maybe you would want to build empathy and these become the performers of your life. Uh, in another example, the theme could be family and you might want to be a good mother and a partner. And you feel that to be a good mother and a partner, you might want to have more energy and maybe able to manage time better. So these become the performers for your life so that you can be true to your theme, theme of your life, the purpose on an everyday basis. Uh, now, this is the step wherein I would want you to brainstorm, use your head, use your brain to identify what are the behaviors that you would want to portray so that you are true to, the, uh, true to your purpose in life. Moving to the final step, the third edge, which is the hands. The last step is basically to connect your performers to little actions that we practice on every single day. For example, as a healer, because I want to be more calm, I would like to practice meditation daily. And maybe because I want to build empathy, I would like to do a course on uh, listening skills. And while at the same time, I want to be more calm and positive, I would want to eliminate or restrict my use of uh, you know, social media or news websites because I, I realize they affect my mind negatively and they stop me from being calm and compassionate. So there are things that I would want to do and there are things that I would not want to do on a daily basis. The little actions as a family person, as a mother, as a good partner, to have more energy, maybe I would want to include a good smoothie, healthy smoothie for my breakfast or maybe want to exercise every day in the morning. Or maybe to manage my time better, I realize that on a daily basis I have been spending 
a lot of time watching the OTT platform or the YouTube YouTube videos or spending a lot of time online uh, playing online games and I would identify them as my time wasters and I would want to eliminate or restrict them on my uh, daily basis. So essentially this step involves listing, listing down little actions that help us stay in tune to our theme and purpose and eliminate the daily actions that do not align to our theme in life. You see, the same approach is uh, uh, applicable to the digital habits. Knowing the intention behind every app that we use on our phone, every social media website, uh, every, uh, you know, every uh, app that we use, every device we use, every website we use, if the intention is to align that thing to our purpose in life, we can keep it. If it does not align to our purpose in life, we need to let go of it because it weakens our root system. It weakens the root of the tree of life that we have. Therefore, I personally believe that following this 3H model and aligning our daily digital habits and other actions can help us lead a life that is more meaningful to ourselves and also more meaningful to the entire world. Uh, I would like to conclude by this quote, uh, with science now and with technology, everything has been figured out. Uh, you see, we know everything except how to live. Uh, to live our life with kindness, love and compassion towards each other, to live a life with purpose and meaning, and to live a life with healthy habits is something that no technology can teach us. We need to take individual ownership to create a beautiful life and a beautiful world for ourselves. Because after all, we just have one life to live. With this, I would like to um, thank each of you for participating in this webinar. And uh, we are truly grateful for your presence and we hope we could provide value to you. Uh, but right now, we would want to take uh, answer any questions that each uh, one of you would have. And uh, you can put your questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Uh, and we would like to take the questions now. Thank you, Ankita. That was a really, really great presentation. Really, really like the, um, the point that you ended on. Um, so that was awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, if, if people have any questions now, um, I know we went a few minutes, few minutes over, um, past two o'clock. So thank you for uh, for staying with us. Um, if you have any questions now, you can either post them in the chat box, unmute yourself. Um, we also uh, have all of our contact information there, both our emails and our um, phone numbers. So you can also reach out to us separately. Um, but yeah, any questions now would be a great time because if you're thinking of the question. Probably other people in the audience are uh, wondering the same thing. So feel free to ask any questions at this time. Well, um, if, if there aren't any questions, and again, you know, feel free to reach out to us individually. Um, I'd just like to, uh, to wrap up and thank you all um, for joining us today. I hope it was Hope it was valuable. I hope uh, hope you have at least a couple things that you can take away and uh, utilize to um, to make your life and to make society um, just a little bit better. So, thank you all, um, Ankita Gagandeep. Any any final words? You're you're muted. You're muted. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it it's a real big encouragement for all of us that you could uh, join us. And uh, some people are joining from India, so it's late night there. So thank you so much for taking your time out. Uh, we feel very grateful to all of you. Yeah, uh, again, I would like to thank each one of you for participating. I truly believe that you know every session is uh, enriches us uh, personally. So it's been a great experience for me. And thank you, Gagan, for having me and uh, for facilitating all this uh, webinar. Thank you, Josh, for having me particularly. It was a delightful experience having the session with you guys. Thank you all. This was, yeah, thank you again to um, Pita and Gagandeep. You both um, did an amazing job. And thank you all for, for joining us.
feel free to reach out um, with any questions or any comments, and uh, we will have future future presentations. So uh, stay tuned. But thank you all. Bye, everybody.